Now that we've gathered all of the reagents and instrumentation that we need for the BCASA, we're ready to get started. First thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna prepare our standard curve. In our case here, we're following the thermos protocol and therefore their data sheet. So in our example, we're simply gonna use BSA. We're gonna start from their stock solution at 2000 micrograms per milliliter, and we're gonna prepare eight dilutions for that standard curve. Those dilutions are gonna range between 25 and 2000 micrograms per milliliter. Again, if you refer to their data sheet, it really walks you through this, um, how to prepare this dilution step by step. All right, now that our standard curve is ready, it's time to prepare our unknowns or test samples. Now in our case, we already expect our test samples to fall within the linear range of the assay, which is between 20 and 2000 micrograms per microliter but we always wanna make sure that we are in the linear range of the assay, so we're still gonna have two dilutions of each sample. To prepare that, we're gonna make a one, one-to-one -one dilution, and we're gonna have to dilute those samples in the same buffer they're currently in, which is probably your extraction buffer, something like REPA buffer. Just double check and use that buffer. Now, we're gonna have three technical replicates of each sample. If we know that each well is gonna take 25 microliters of sample, that means we need to have a minimum of 75 microliters of sample ready to use. If we keep in mind that we always wanna have an additional 10% just to account for pipetting errors, our recommendation is that you will mix 45 microliters of sample with 45 microliters of buffer to a final volume of 90 microliters. All right, so at this point we have our standard curve and our test samples ready. Next step is to prepare our working reagent. To figure out how much reagent we need to prepare, we need to know how many samples we're using and all of that. So there's a simple equation that can help us with that. Today we're gonna walk you through an equation that was adapted from Thermos protocol. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add up the number of standard points that we have, the number of blank samples that we have, and then the number of unknown or test samples. Now remember that when we're talking about our unknowns, we should take into account the different dilutions for each sample. Then we're gonna get that number and we're gonna multiply that by the number of technical replicates that we have and then get that number and multiply it by the volume of working reagent that we need for each sample. That will give us the total volume of working reagent that we need. Now let's not forget to take into account that we should always have an additional 10% just to account for small pipetting errors. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna get that number which is the total volume of working reagent needed and we're gonna multiply it by 1.1 giving us the volume of working reagent to prepare. So we have eight standards, one blank, and three samples in two different dilutions to a total of six unknown samples. If we add those numbers up, eight plus one plus six, that equals 15. Now we multiply that number by the number of technical replicates that we have, which is three, so 15 times three, which equals to 45. Last step on this equation is to multiply that number by the volume of working reagent needed per sample, which is 0.2 milliliters. 45 times 0.2 equals nine milliliters. So the last step here is to multiply nine by 1.1, which equals to 9.9. .9. We can just round that up and say 10 milliliters. That's the volume of working reagent solution we need to prepare. To prepare a working reagent, we're gonna mix 50 parts of reagent A to one part of reagent B. Since we need a minimum of 10 milliliters of working reagent, we're actually gonna prepare a little bit more just so we have round numbers, reducing the chances of pipetting error. So in our case, we're gonna mix 12 and a half milliliters of reagent A with 0.25 milliliters of reagent B. That solution is gonna be turbid at first, but once it's perfectly homogenized, it's gonna become a clear green solution that is stable for one week at room temperature. Time to add our samples to the plate. We're gonna be adding 25 microliters of sample per well, and because this is not an endpoint reaction, meaning that that bio-red reaction never truly stops, we're gonna spread those samples across the plate. In our case here, we have decided to load the standard curve samples on columns one, three, and five, and our unknown samples and our blanks on columns two, four, and six. 
time to add the working reagent to the plate. Now let's remember that this is not an endpoint assay, so we recommend that you do this step as fast as possible. Using a multi-channel pipette can help you accomplish this faster while you add the 200 microliters of working reagent per well. Once that is done, we're gonna seal the plate, gently vortex it, and spin it down for about 30 seconds. With the plate still sealed, we're gonna place it at 37 degrees for 30 minutes. After the incubation is over, we're gonna bring that temperature down to room temperature, which should take about 15 minutes. Once the plate reaches room temperature, we're ready to read it at 562 nanometers. If your plate reader does not have that specific channel, you can always use the range of 540 to 590 nanometers without compromising sensitivity. Now that we have calculated the absorbance of all of our samples, it's time to start the data analysis. First things first, we need to subtract background, which means subtracting the blank value from all of our standards as well as our unknown samples. Next, we have to calculate the average of each point of our standard curve, and then we're going to plot that data on a graph starting from the lowest to the highest concentration. Once we have plotted the standard curve graph, we want to calculate the linearity of our test using a regression curve. That step is very important because we want to make sure that our unknown samples fall within the linear range of the test. If they don't, we're going to have to discard them and redo the test all over again. And then we're going to double check that they did fall within the linear range of the test. At that point, we're ready to interpolate our data and we can use three different forms of data interpolation. The order of preference is as follows. The best one is to use a four parameter or quadratic calculation. If that is not an option, you can always just use a best fit curve, or if you have to do the calculation by hand, a point to point calculation should be okay. Don't forget to take into account the dilution factors of your diluted samples. And in our example here, you will see that if our sample had an absorption of 0.6, the protein concentration of that sample was 619 micrograms per milliliter. So let's do a brief overview of how our BCA protocol went. First, we prepared our standards, then we prepared our unknown or test samples, and we added them spread out on a plate together with the blank samples. We sealed that plate, vortexed it, spinned it down, incubated at 37 degrees, brought that plate down to room temperature, and then measured the absorption at 562 nanometers. At that point, we did our data analysis by plotting the standard curve and interpolating the data. There are a few adjustments that you can do to the protocol, so it's better suited for your particular sample volume and protein concentration. For example, as long as you do changes in all of your samples, including standards, unknowns, and blanks, you can adjust the ratio of working reagent per sample volume or even the incubation time. If you change the incubation temperature from 37 degrees to 60 degrees, that's going to significantly increase the sensitivity of the assay, but it's going to reduce its dynamic range for 5 to 250 micrograms per milliliter. Now, if you run into issues where your assay is not developing the proper color, it's very likely that you have a contamination issue. That contamination could be a copper chelating agent or a reducing agent or even lipid contamination. So always refer to your data sheet when you have that sort of issue and they can walk you through how to troubleshoot that. So if you're considering that maybe your sample is contaminated with something because you're not getting the expected results, there's a simple test that you can do to confirm that. You're gonna be preparing three sets of sample. First, you're gonna prepare the standard curve just like we just discussed. Then you're also going to prepare the serial dilution of one of the samples that you're questioning. The third set of samples is to combine your standard curve with a serial dilution of your sample. Measure the absorption of all of them and then plot it on a graph. What would you expect to see? Well, your standard curve should have a nice trend. Your unknown alone will probably not present a nice trend, which is why you're testing it in the first place. Now, if the combination of your standard 
with your test sample still presents a nice trend similar to what is observed for your standards alone, then your sample is not contaminated with anything and it's probably an issue with the protein sample itself. Perhaps there's no protein there. Whereas if you observe that with the two samples combined, the trend is not correct, then your sample is probably contaminated. For a full list of contaminating substances, please refer to the data sheet of the kit you're using.